All right then, if you have your Bibles with you this evening, 1 John chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3, some of my favorite scriptures, um, they uh, speak of the, uh, uh, the inimmutability inimmut inimmut of God's changing people, He changes, He saves them and that never changes, uh, He saves them forever, and that's what we'll be looking at tonight. Uh, 1 John chapter 3, in the first verse, the Bible says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and, doeth, and it doeth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth him himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth, transgresseth also the law, for, the, for sin is the transgression of the law. And you know that he was manifested to take our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth have not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteous is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might des destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doeth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the ones that are here tonight, Lord. We uh, thank you for the church here at Dover, Lord, that you would allow us to be uh, a steadfast place for your word. Lord God, we pray that you would draw people to yourself, Lord, to here at the church, and that you would uh, cause us to be seen and known of in this place, that we might be a voice for you. Lord, we pray that you would bless all the internet ministries, Lord, and the outreach there. God, help us to be a people uh, that would magnify thy name, bless your word to the hearts of the hearers, and we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all, for it is in Christ's name we do pray. <coughs> Amen. Now, uh, uh, the book of 1 John, uh, so some people believe that it was uh, written by the Apostle John, and I, I believe that too. That is the my take on it, but uh, some believe it was other Johns that wrote these books, and I'm not here to debate it, but I do know that it's inspired right. But the only thing that I will... Uh, uh, point you to in this John the writer doesn't speak of himself either and that was a trademark of the Apostle John uh, so he begins in, verse, in chapter 3 behold what manner of love the Father had this had bestowed upon us now love from the Lord God Almighty has to be bestowed or placed on us because we're unworthy of it. Uh, we don't. We, it's an impossibility despite all the heresy that's out there today. There's nothing more than the goodness of God that entitles us to His love. We can't be good enough. We can't ask for it. We don't have the capability to earn it. It is simply bestowed on us like uh, salvation. And, and he, uh, the writer here says, you think about that. You look at the manner of love that he bestowed on you. 
And uh, we can talk about the love of God all night, but just in, in, in the minutest detail is the health that he sustains us with every day to go on. Might not be as good as it was 20 years ago, but we're still able to get up and get to moving and hear of the goodness of God. If you're saved, you saved your never dying soul, and if you're lost, he sustained you unto now. That's a love that, that we can't understand with this bodily mind, but yet and still it is. That's the manner of the love of God. It begins completely as a one-sided love. Then he saves you, and the love becomes communal. Amen. But it's a one-sided love to begin. That's the manner, the, the method of his love. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Now, that, that's an amazing thing to me, but uh, uh, remember the Lord Jesus Christ says uh, he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Mm -hmm. And that makes us sons, just like he is the son of God, we are sons, and if you want to say it like this, daughters of God. And, and gender, gender in glory is inconsequential. Because he said that we would be as the angel, neither male nor female. And that's why often it's listed just simply as the sons of God and not as the people of God. Not necessarily a bad word, but like I said, in glory, there is no difference anyway. It, it, there, there's, no, uh, there's nothing there to, uh, to discriminate against. And so we find here when he says this, that we be the children of the Almighty. Therefore, the world knoweth us not. Now, that's very important because, listen, in some venues today, it's seemingly that that isn't the case, that there are churches and movements just mushrooming. But remember, they don't know God and they don't know us. Mm -hmm. by, by the perspective many today, uh, the Lord's churches are way down here because they look at money and numbers and things like that. But just remember, they don't know us. And you have to take it by that verse, and they don't know God either. And, and, and so we see, we, we see then, uh, we shouldn't be discouraged, but we should be greatly uh, excited that he bestowed that unto us. Verse 2, he addresses the group now as loved people. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And you know, that's the beginning, the end. If life should end right now and you are a child of God, what could be better? If you're not that person, if you're not a child of God, seek ye Lord, the Lord while you may be found. Uh, don't ever give up. Don't give up on your children, your grandchildren. Keep, keep praying. Keep desiring their salvation. And I fully believe that the Lord would, will bless. We are the sons of God. That's an unbelievable statement. Beloved, now, ye, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Now, I personally believe he means this in glory. It means in the time ahead. Uh, I don't think, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people that believe in progressive sanctification, a lot of holiness people believe that. And what they mean is that we're just getting better and better, and one day we'll appear to what we're supposed to be. Uh, but I believe what he means that we'll appear in glory. It will be far different than we have right now. Can you imagine not having to struggle with this flesh ever, ever again? I, I really can't even, I can't even grasp that. It excites me, and it makes me glad when I think about it, but it's far, you know, I've just been struggling with it for 53 years that I can't imagine a daily struggle without it. And, but, but we do know that it's coming. So we're going to be like that down the road. But we know, we, we don't know exactly what it's going to be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, what that tells me, and it's talking in a futuristic tense, we haven't seen him yet for what he is. 
Now, I see this answer to my sin as the only plea that I have. But I haven't seen him for what he is. Right. Uh, I haven't seen his purity. I haven't seen his goodness. I, I haven't seen his power in its fullness yet. But I certainly will. Uh, listen, that's why you be very... Uh, what was it to the, the little epistle of um, Jude, I think? Little children, keep yourselves from... Uh, is it images or idols? I think it's one of those words. It's because we don't know what he looks like. Mm -hmm. It would be much purer, more, much more pure than anything that we can understand right now. And, and we're going to be like that. We're going to have the same, we're going to have the, the same base as he has. Now, he'll still, still be far ahead of us, far above us in his office and in what he does, but we are going to give this flesh away one glad day. We're going to be like him. Verse 3. But every man have this hope in him, and every man that have this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he, meaning Christ, is pure. Now, if you have that hope, it says here you'll purify yourself. Now, a lot of people will again say, well, there's your works for salvation. You've got to keep on working at it. But when you're purifying something, the work is not yours. If you're making wine, you're not doing the work. It's purifying itself, right? Yeah. And, and, and it is a process over time. So I believe really this, if you're not improving in service, I'd make my calling and election sure. If you're not improving and embracing that word of God for exactly what it says, I, I would look at myself. If you don't, if, if you don't uh, 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 come to terms with the Bible is very clear on dress and modesty and, and, and being the leader of your home at those things, then, then look at it because, see, we're supposed to be purified further and further all the time. And being purified makes you embrace the Word of God. Irregardless if it feels good or if it feels bad, you still love it. That, that, is, that is the purification. Now, it's not progressive sanctification, but certainly the redeemed, the truly redeemed desire to be more like unto Christ routinely. Verse 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And certainly that is all inclusive. And we know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Now, I want you to notice two things. Uh, we're condemned under the law. Now, this has been in my lifetime, and, and, and it's just mushroomed uh, as, as time has gone by, but that is the Messianic Jew movement. They believe in Christ, the Messiah, but they also believe in, in keeping the Jewish law. Uh, well, let me, let me tell all those people this. The Bible says Christ fulfilled the law. Uh, that, that's not ours to deal with. That is not ours to worry about. Uh, uh, time and time again, as Paul is writing the church letter, writing in the church letter, he says the law is gone. Uh, we're, we're no longer attached to that. Uh, and if the law is there, then it all has to be there, including the sacrificial law. You can't pick and choose which laws remain, right? And, and, and that is the premise and, uh, of that movement, and it gets bigger every day, literally, people embracing these things. So I want you to see the reason that is not so is Christ fulfilled it. He fulfilled it in every rule. The Bible says every jot and tittle was filled by the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. What more could be done? He fulfilled the law, and that's why we're not Jews. We're Christians. That's what that, we're Christ-like. <clears throat> Verse 6. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. 
Now that's a huge verse in, 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 in verse 6. That's a huge statement to be made. And, and, and I, I will say this, first of all, someone that's continually given to sin and never separates himself, herself, uh, continually again and again and again, the same sins, I would be very leery of. Now, I sin daily, but thanks be to God, I'm grieved over it. I, I get mad at myself. I, I get disappointed in myself. And I get troubled about the things in my life. But I'd be more worried if I didn't. If, if it's just okay with me. If, if it didn't bother me. That's the difference between the redeemed and the lost. That their sin is, is comfortable. Now... With that said, I'll give you one more fair warning. You say, lay around and sin long enough, it'll, be, it'll get comfortable to the best of us. So very, very cautious when, uh, when you're exposed to sin. So we find that John makes it very clear, probably if you lie in sin, you've never been born again to start with. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he, meaning Christ, is righteous. Now we really, and Brother Kenny, and I'm not going to reteach his lesson from Sunday, but he did a very good job to, to uh, outline what spiritual snobs are about. And, and what uh, five pointers stand in much of the time. But I want you to see if they're doing righteous, only thing you can come to is they're righteous people. Yeah. And uh, we get we get pretty upset when people don't cross their eye, uh, cross the T's and dot the I's like us. But don't look at that. <laughs> According to this, we look at their lives. We look at how they present. What are they doing? And and we find then that if we go by that, probably a lot of people, a lot more people have uh, no more than even we would like to believe because we want to believe we're the only ones that have any kind of spirituality at all. But look at their fruits, and this is not the only time Paul says uh, uh, in uh, uh, by, I believe in Thessalonians by their fruits. Ye shall know them. Look at what's going on, not what they're saying. And that's a, that's, that, that's a very difficult thing uh, for me to learn. But I believe uh, John's letter here makes it pretty, pretty clear. He that committeth sin is of the devil. Mm -hmm. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. Now I think that's a very interesting statement because when Lucifer was among, among the angels and, and, and he rose up in that rebellion against the Almighty, it says that even before that, he sinneth from the beginning. The very moment he was spoken into being by the Almighty, he was already sinning. Mm -hmm. He was already up from the very beginning. He thought he was better than Michael, the archangel, and he thought he was better than God. From the very beginning. And, and, and so we find that that should, his rebellion and, and, and then him being thrown out of glory should be no great surprise to us when the Lord God Almighty looks at the wicked and says, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. And casts them into the lake of fire. There should be no great surprise to us because he's righteous. The, the, those sin from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the work of the devil. Now, if you will look at that, that's two full sentences in the same verse, presenting two separate ideas. They're somewhat related, but they're separate. First of all, he displays or describes the nature of the devil, and then he describes the Son of God's remedy in the second statement, the second sentence. 
and uh, they're, they're, they're very wonderful thoughts, but separate. Because there was so much sin, because that was the nature of the devil, and therefore the nature of mankind, Jesus came to answer sin for us. Verse 9, Whosoever is born of God doeth not commit sin. Now that is a very difficult very difficult statement to comprehend. It is one that 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 uh, is glorious to us, but for others they think, well, I never can be saved because I always commit sin. But no, but notice the context: whosoever is born of God doeth not commit sin. Now that's just that that's not saying if you sin, you're in you're going to hell. It is saying, if you've truly been born of God, this inward nature no longer sins. It, it, in fact, the Bible says it's impossibility. Mm -hmm. It's an impossibility. And that's not on your merit. That's on the merit of Christ. That's right. Amen. And remember what the Bible says of the redeemed. Ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. You ever thought about how separate your, your inward man is, your desire to love the Lord Jesus and to serve, to serve Him as you should, and the, and the outer flesh is just so vile and wicked, and, and how they can be contrary? Well, there's a huge seal between them. It's just like uh, the current that runs through an electric cord. It's sealed off. And the inward man, the redeemed part, is sealed. Now listen, it should influence your life. But unfortunately for this flesh, it's certainly not going to control this life. Uh, when I was a young man in my 20s, I thought by the time I was in my 50s, things would be easier. But what I had found, and my father-in-law tried to tell me this then, it, it's worse now than it was then. And I have to believe now that it's going to be worse when I'm 80 sure. than it is now. Sure. Because the flesh doesn't improve. It deteriorates, right? And not only does it deteriorate physically, uh, our, our nature bent towards sin, it just gets worse. It does not improve. It, it, it is not... It is not replaceable. And so until what he refers in uh, verse uh, 3, and that we put off this mess, that will be our nature. And, and until we become like unto the Lord Jesus Christ, this is what we'll deal with. Now notice in uh, verse 10. And this, little children of God, are manifest... In this, the children of God are manifest. In other words, if they, if they present, if they're not bent towards sin, if it is not their uh, nature to sin, in this, the children of God are manifest, and the children of devil, whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. He gives us two, hint, two, two hallmarks of the redeemed. And, and the first one is this, whosoever doeth not righteousness. Have uh, you been doing right righteousness lately? Uh, um, I've been reading this book that was set in the 1930s. And uh, I love the book. I read it in high school and I read it again later. I'm reading it again now. And it, it's a it, part of the book uh, talks about a trial, a trial in a courtroom, and this man's being tried for murder. And uh, one of the uh, one of the witnesses says something somewhat foul, not like nothing we can think of today, but still out of sorts. And uh, the judge rebukes this man and says, "This is a godly court, uh, courtroom, and you will use Christian terms." I thought, "Man, what a change in eighty years! What what an incredible difference between now and then!" And uh, so, I want you to see that the 
The redeemed are to act righteous. They're, they're to avoid that. Uh, if, if there's contention, we need to leave it alone. If there's difficulty, we need to uh, we need to distance ourselves from that. Uh, I thought the situation at, at uh, work would get better. Listen, it didn't. So you know what? I have to distance myself from that. Because you know what? Contention and sin will consume you. Now, it can consume your soul, but it can consume right. you. Yeah. And, and, and take uh, and take full testimony away from you. And certainly we as the Lord's people, we do not need to be found in that situation. In this, the children of God are met, manifest or obvious, and the children of the devil of the devil, whosoever doeth not who doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Now, uh, you can only answer that for yourself. And I have some people that very much claim to be Christians that are difficult to love. But that's no excuse. Uh, I'd like it to be excuse, wouldn't you? Uh, I, would, I would like it that I didn't see eye to eye on them. And, and that gave me a reason not to like them. But that is not what the scripture is teaching. I am to love them. I am to be interested in them. I, I am to be in a situation that uh, I, would, I, I would want the very best for them. That is loving your brother. And that's not me, and even though I do, that's not me loving James Dale. That's me loving you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. That's me loving the church at Sunnyview and the church at Faith in Clarksville and the church at Julian. That is what this means. It, it's the hallmark of the redeemed. And I dare say very, very frequently, we don't, we don't live up to the mark. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that ye should love one another. Uh, Little children, love you one another. Does that sound familiar? <coughs> Lord Jesus Christ, served on the mount, We're to, we are to love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one. If you ever wonder about Cain's salvation, that clears it up. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, meaning the devil. He belonged to the devil. Cain was not a saved man. But not as Cain, who was of the devil, and slew his brother, and therefore, and wherefore he slew him? Why did, why did Cain kill Abel? Because his own works were evil. And his brothers were righteous. Now, there's been some discussion, in, uh, you know, about the works of Cain. Now, I don't know if his works would have been okay if he came with the right attitude. I think personally they went against the example that God gave them from the beginning. But irregardless, it says that his works were evil. Even when he put them seeds in the ground, he wasn't glorifying God in it. He's glorifying himself. Or maybe even then, he could not stand Abel. And he's shoving the, uh, the seed in as his brother walked away with the sheep. And he said, I can't stand that man. He was evil from the beginning. And, uh, and it burst out on him uh, like chicken pox, and that's how he lived his life, was in rebellion to God, even to the very end, when he was cast out and put in another place. Verse 13, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. Now, it'll be very easy one day to get on the blacklist. It'll be very easy one day uh, to be uh, identified as people do, do, that do not love. Uh, sodomite people, do I hate them? I can't say that I do. I certainly hate that lifestyle. But I'll tell you this on the same token. I'm not going to marry men and men and women and women. And you know, one day, that will be a token to be hated by. That, that will be a hallmark of the mean people. Uh, of the people that, that are not loving. And, and so, uh, 
John says, don't marvel about it. Uh, don't be upset. Don't be amazed because they're not going to like you. The world is going to hate you and they're going to hate for what you stand for. Verse 14, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren, back again, the hallmark of the redeemed, loving people, he that loveth not his brother abideth in death. It means he lives there. It means he stays there. That means, his that means it's his pleasant place is to abide in death. You know what we need to do? You want New Testament to grow? Love each other and love, and, and love people. That, that, that's your formula for growing church. You know, back in the 70s, 60s and 70s, the formula for growing a church was Jack Howe's mess about this easy believism and your church would explode. Listen, that was never the formula of God. But what is the formula of God is to love one another and love people. Now, you may not agree with them, but me and Brother Junior was talking about this before service time. Got some neighbors he tries to help. Keep loving them. Uh, now, I know you'll never agree with the mess they teach, but keep loving them. Who knows what the Lord might do <coughs> when it's all said and done? If nothing else, they can say, well, they were some good neighbors. Love you one another. And that sometimes will be the hardest thing you do. Let me say, let me tell you this, church. Anger will consume you. Amen. Yeah. It will take you over and change who you are. And nothing could be worse. Nothing could be worse because when that happens, you've lost your testimony. And, and so we certainly need to, to live this and be the ones that show love. Verse 15, whosoever hated his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderers have eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because we laid because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Now uh, that's a big statement. I've seen this fulfilled out in different books I've read down through the years. And people being threatened with their lives to tell the government where, where the rest of their church was. And then saying absolutely not. And, and taking death in that stance. Uh, embracing death to protect the others. But what about giving your life? Uh, think about Brother Kraft. When he went to the mission field, he was either 29 or 30. And when he came home last year... He was almost 60. I think he loved those people unto death, don't you? I mean, the average lifespan, and poor old Brother Christ about like me, he's not taking care of his body nearly the way we should. We got 10 years left. I think he's given his life for the brethren, don't you? It doesn't necessarily, and, and, and it could, I mean, it could be lying down and, and giving your life up. But giving your life for the brethren is giving life that others might hear the gospel. If they're next door or if in the next hemisphere, you're willing to do it. And that is giving your life. That's laying your life down for the brethren. Not just on Sunday and Wednesday night, but literally laying your life down. Well, whatever situation you find yourself, you find yourself in that situation spreading the gospel. And it's a wonderful thing when churches can afford to have, quote, unquote, a full-time pastor. But listen, uh, all of us are on full-time. Every one of the sound of my voice are on full-time. And we've got, to, we've got to give ourselves, give all of ourselves. Uh -huh. uh, used to be a song, I can't even remember now. I don't think, unfortunately, it was a gospel song. Uh, about your parents teaching it, to, teaching you to give it all you have. That that's the that's the story of Christ. He gave everything he had, and that's exactly what we should do too.